I know it's early, but I'm an American, and I need to know you're in this. <laughs> yes, I am, Janice. Thank you very much. The 12th, I was the 12th executive director of the World Food Program, but I was performing this work. This work to ensure access to nutritious food, overcoming the challenges of food insecurity long before I was executive director. And after leaving the World Food Program, I have continued this work through research and advocacy and now working on a project to hopefully create a new institute that will continue to drive the market-based investments that are necessary for us to achieve the SDGs. So, yeah, I'm the 12th executive director. Thank you very much for that. But there's a lot more to me, and you'll hear about it this morning. I am humbled, truly, to stand here today. Because you're, from your very first FFA, this, con this conference has attracted to this stage leaders from across agriculture, food, and the environmental communities. Each leader articulating the what, the why, and in many instances, even the how for delivering sustainable food systems to meet the nutritious food and consumption needs of a growing population. The members of this community all agree that siloed thinking and action will not deliver the requisite sustainable change required to achieve the SDGs. The SDGs clearly delineate the universal, inextricable goal for securing a world of peace and prosperity for all. The 193 UN member states unanimously embraced this sustainable roadmap for change. And last year, uh, Chairman Janice Pototnik articulated six priority goals, and my favorite was number six, when he told us to stop holding workshops and group photos for the SDGs reminding this FFA audience that change does not come from groups putting the SDGs in the annex of your annual reports. And further, he reminded us that it is high time we got serious about SDG implementation. So let's get serious. As we begin our discussion, focusing on the next generation, let, re let me remind you about those furthest behind. The 821 million people who are food secure, food insecure. And that today, 500 million small and family farmers supply between 75 and 80% of all the food we consume. Yet 80% of those smallholder farmers are included in the 821 million people who are food insecure. Small farmers are often the hungriest people. And of those 500 million farmers, some 70% of them live in climate marginal places, affected by ever more erratic weather patterns. And let me remind you that while we speak of the next generation and ag agriculture, the average farmer anywhere in the world is 59 years of age. Even in sub-Saharan Africa, where 60% of the population is below 25. And population projections suggest that by 2050, the African youth population below 25 will exceed 1 billion. And while we sit here today, 1 million young people turn 18 every month in India. And between now and 2030 in Sub-Saharan Africa, the number of young labor market participants and available job opportunities widens by approximately some 8 million per year. So how do we balance the increasing needs of the next generation with the finite resources our planet can offer? First. Siloed thinking 
and action will not deliver the requisite sustainable change required to achieve the SDGs or to meet the increasing needs of the next generation. We all agree our food system is broken. A nearly harmonious clarion call for increased crop diversity does not move us beyond today's unenviable situation where 60% of all kilocalories consumed on this planet derive from four crops, white, rice, wheat, corn, and soy, despite the 30,000 plus varietals of edible, more nutritious plants growing, but too often forgotten or orphaned as they're called and ignored across the globe. I'm excited that FFA recognizes that it's not just about agriculture community coming to these conversations, that bringing in the environmental community is also an imperative to ensure that we address the challenges. But I, as I've said to the organizers, also look forward to next year when you bring the water community and the energy community as well into this conversation. Because it is, requires that all of us, including academics, experts, government, policy, and development actors, all agree on the policies and activities and we must perform together to create the coherence that is required for us to move forward progress Yes, progress is being made already without us coming into this room. Yes, we can talk about progress. Progress in, in all kinds of areas. In, in January of 2018, the African Union launched an agriculture transformation scorecard, taking the progress of achieving the Malibu Declaration commitments on agriculture, productivity, investment, and development Unfortunately, only 20% of the 47 countries are considered on track. Yet it's a start that the countries are beginning to measure because what gets measured is what counts. And in March of 2018, more progress. African leaders established a free trade zone with 44 countries signing the Free African Trade Agreement, potentially covering 1.2 billion people and $2 trillion in spending. But unfortunately, neither Nigeria or South Africa, two of the largest economies, were part of the agreement. But there is more good news. From a global standpoint, the G7 ministers in June of 2018 endorsed the Whistler principles to guide and accelerate the innovation for development impact, including supporting the poorest, investing in local innovators, and using rigorous data. And in July of 2018, the G20 ministers committed to working together on ensuring food security and healthy soils to promote agriculture trade and to combat loss and waste, as well as antimicrobial resistance. And in the same month last year, in September, in, I'm sorry, in September of last year, India celebrated increased nutrition funding led by the Minister of Women and Child Development Activities, including increased antenatal care, girls' education, healthy diets, and sanitation. Yes. Without a doubt, progress is being made. Yet that progress remains too slow and too uneven. And I, I stand before you today, the poorest and the most vulnerable, the women, minority populations, our youth are too often being left behind. And for too many, with the challenges of climate change and inequity, the light at the end of the tunnel to prosperity and sustainable food security grows dimmer with each passing year. So in my remaining few minutes, allow me this opportunity to put forward three, prior, three priority items for actions. Not just the what, but the how for action. Action to achieve both sustainability and prosperity, particularly for young farmers and agripreneurs. First, partnership. 
Yes, partnership, collective action, addressing not just agricultural productivity, but environment, water, logistics, markets, consumer demand, and disposal. Much is happening, yet the efforts remain disjointed, small scale, and too often, despite everything we know, still unsustainable. The partnerships are based upon the programs of what donors will fund. And when those program, money, when those program dollars run out, the activities, the commitment that brought the partners together runs out. And too often, any progress made also stops. Working together for food systems to overcome structural challenges in order to make sustainable, full system improvements that will provide opportunities for the next generation, we must create not just collective action, not just partnerships based on program dollars, but trust-based, communication-driven, and human-centered systems thinking collective action. Thinking design not just for sustainability, but also for collaborative action to deliver at scale. We have too many joint opportunities where we bring our communities together and we affect 3,000 people or 4,000 people and we can't scale. Or because of our organizational mandates, we work alone. When we know no one actor working alone will deliver the myriad of services required to meet the desired objective of developing a complete food system that meets the needs of the next generation with the finite resources our planet can offer. Effective outcome-driven partnerships require moving from partnership talk to partnership action across the entire value chain or the entire supply chain. And not just here in Europe, but partnership action across the developing world as well. The second priority action, even when we accomplish the objective-oriented, trust-based, collective action, we must whether in the developed or developing worlds, sustainably the address the challenges of raising incomes and standards of living in, in the agriculture community, which will require context-based regulatory and policy change for farmers and agripreneurs across the food system. Policy change that creates the enabling environment to support the market-driven solutions that will increase wages and in some communities to simply make a living wage beyond the subsistence existence of today. This is where tools like the all-important scorecards provide value because measuring regulatory environment, including quantifiable business policy and systems, including the ease of doing business, makes a difference because even for governments, naming and faming does matter and incentivize government action. We must also get into one of those areas that's always sticky to talk to whether you're in the US or EU or in the developing world. We must eliminate perverse incentives and subsidies. I recognize time-bound targeted subsidies do provide benefits, but too often we're providing support to those who need it least and not supporting the challenges, including access to land for young farmers or loan support for agripreneurs. So ensuring that our policies meet the context that are required is key to addressing the challenges that will provide an opportunity for us not to just hand over an agriculture system to the next generation, but one that works. And the third and final priority action 
is adequate patient capital. Because even with a commitment to sustainable collective action and an ad adequate business and policy and regulatory environment, systematic change to create food systems capable of feeding 10 billion by 2050 and raising incomes and standards of living in the agriculture sector to move young people into this sector. People are always asking, well, how do you move young people into the sector? And you hear many who have now started adopting the phrase, make agriculture sexy. And I say make agriculture profitable and young people will move into the sector. And so a food system capable of making agricultural sexy enough to attract and maintain a younger generation of farmers will require adequate investment in infrastructure, education, and off-farm business development, including ag tech and innovation, to make rural life profitable, interesting enough, and not a push to the bright lights of the city. And none of this will occur without adequate funding. Again, the call for more donor, government, and private sector investment in rural development and agriculture has been a common theme from this FFA stage. The difference I offer today is a suggestion that to meet the $5 trillion agriculture and food system opportunity projected for the African continent and to meet the food nutrition requirements of feeding nine and a half billion people by 2050 around the global community, we need to massively increase global involvement in not just the food system here in Europe and global investments, not just in the food system here in Europe and the US, but all the food systems across the globe. We won't get there from the food system investments that are made today. Because global flows of foreign direct, domestic, foreign direct investment decreased by 23% in 2017, creating that tension between all the different communities vying for those floods. And flows to the least developed countries decreased by seven, an additional 17% on top of the 23% in the entire global community. So a decrease of almost 30%. Specifically, across Africa, average foreign direct investments decreased by 31% in 2017. And in 2019, while private sector investments and remittances increased year over year, foreign direct investments remains the largest external source of finance for the agriculture in the developing world. And the World Bank, FAO, and IFPRI all agree crowding in private sector investment in the agriculture sector will help achieve SDG 2 and optimize the use of scarce resources. The data also shows investing in agricultural productivity is one of the most effective ways to advance youth livelihoods. Private sector investment across the food system, yes, does increase every year. Sources including local and international banks, value chain actors, impact investors, development financing institutions, private sector foundations, and specialized agriculture investment funds. Yet the demand for rural infrastructure, ag tech, food tech, and agriculture food system innovations requires capital far in excess of the funds invested today. Food system improvement opportunities, when adequately packaged and managed, provide a host of opportunities for patient capital investors to participate in growth and income derived from processing, transporting, and selling food. In other words, there is money to be made in agriculture across the entire global community. The $500 trillion in sovereign wealth, pension funds, and family funds, we need to bring that money into this sector. Because smart investors understand investing in agriculture and food may not provide immediate returns, 
but over the long term, these investments can pay off handsomely. So yes, agriculture's and food system investments are inherently risky business. Yes, risk mitigation tools abound in Europe and the U.S. from insurance to subsidy support. This is no suggestion that governments or donors should single-handedly assume the risk in developing countries. We can identify innovative, creative financing to scale up the good brownfield asset classes and to catalyze greenfield new innovations across the food system. You all are awfully quiet out there. But it always gets really quiet when I talk about money. But the reality is, we can continue to convene here in Brussels, or we can go to Geneva, or New York, or Rome, and take our photos, sipping our coffee, and talk about what it takes to deliver a food system that will sustainably nourish our growing population, sustainably nourish the next generation, drive opportunities. But without capital, it is just that, all talk. So we can take a different path. We can begin to embrace the more challenging how-to solutions that will make, risk, make, that will make a difference, not just for the affluent and the middle class, but also for women, youth, and particularly the poor and underserved. The choice is ours. The time is now to stop talking about what we all know and agree upon what we must do and move forward to do it. Move into the riskier, less comfortable action that will make the universal difference, creating a food system capable of, of, sustainably, of sustainably nourishing, nourishing us all, our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. You're going to sit in that chair there. Arthur and Cousin, thank you so much. Take a seat. There will be people who remember you from the United Nations because you stand out, <laughs> because you're very direct. Uh, and you bring energy into a room and you challenge people. How's retirement from the UN been? <laughs> Hard work. Tell everybody what you're doing, because I don't want them to think that you're just basing your opening address on your time at the UN, oh, because right you. now you're doing what? Oh, wow. um, I am at Stanford University, um, where I am a distinguished lecturer and visiting fellow in the, in the Center on Food Security and Environment, as well as the Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law. I'm working at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, where we just issued a report last week that I co-chaired on uh, water scarcity and food security, which is why I'm so hyped right now about bringing the water community into this conversation. I serve on the board um, of uh, a number of organizations, including Heifer International and a nutrition organization in the UK, working to address the challenges of access to nutritious food using new tools um, to move us beyond providing food to communities, but helping communities deliver their own, their own food security. We are going to have questions in the room. Uh, we'll bring the lights up and we'll bring some questions into the room. But we'll start online. Often this one is from um, coming to you from online. How can we accelerate systematic change? You're really good on the idea of action. Mm -hmm. So how do we do this? Well, this, uh, when I, what I said about partnership um, is quite real. And uh, I'm excited because the, there's a new partnership in this room uh, that brings in not just the agriculture community, but the environmental community, recognizing that systematic change requires us to get out of our silos. To when, after the 2007 and 2008 food crisis, we focused, we, the operators in the agriculture community, focused on increasing the quality and quantity of yields. And we made some progress in that area. 
But what we found was that progress was very limited because we didn't address the challenges of logistics and access to market and consumer demand. And uh, we didn't address the challenges of food waste. And as a result, what we saw was that a quarter of the food that is harvested in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is more than all of the food aid brought into Sub-Saharan Africa, is wasted every year. And uh, so we knew, we, we began to realize as a community the need for working in partnership across the entire system if we effect, expected to make the structural changes into those, that entire system that would create sustainable change. Your vision for, your vision for the next generation is, is really interesting because you're, feeling, you're, you're saying about money being put into the system so young people will find it attractive. Bearing that in mind, I just want to go to Twitter, hashtag FFA2019. If you have your phones, you want to tweet, you don't want to put your hand up or stand up, you're a little bit shy, you can do it via Twitter and it may well pop up on this screen here. So here's from Twitter. Between now and 2030, the number of young market participants will rise by about 8 million. So how to help farmers deliver for the next generation of consumers? Well, first of all, we need to get more young people into farming because the, the, the uh, average farmer, is, as I said, is, is 59 years of age today. We have large numbers of uh, young people without uh, economic opportunity, and we need to ensure that agriculture, which has always provided pr the baseline for developing GDP growth in, in particularly in, de in developing countries, that w we ensure that that trend includes the young people by providing the financial resources that are necessary. But when you ask the question of how do we do it for consumers, we need to give consumers more visibility on that entire food system. The reality is so many of us in our generation whose families, I'm a granddaughter of a farmer, and my grandparents did everything in their power to educate their children so that none of their children would ever work on a farm and their children's children would not work on a farm. And as a result, we lost sight as consumers of the food system, of the, of the challenges of production, of, of growing food, of producing food, of moving food. And in order for us to build a food system that will support planetary health and human health, we need to have consumers that are educated about their food and recognizing that they want food and demanding, not just recognizing, but demanding food that is sustainably grown, that, is, that is supports planetary health as well as their human health. And that requires us bringing more young people into the conversation to help us the way they do with everything else, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, to drive messaging about the what is possible and what they as consumers and ultimately as farmers and actors across the entire food system can do to make, help us make that change. I want to put the house lights up so we can see the audience, so let's do that. And then uh, the microphones, put your hands up as well. Okay, turn around microphones, see somebody with a hand up, walk to that person, and then we have the first question. Excellent. Thank you so much for your presentation this morning and energizing us in the audience. Good morning. Who Good are morning. you and what's yes. your organization? <laughs> My name is Christine Gould. I'm with Thought for Food, one of the uh, strategic partners of FFA. Uh, we specifically work with young entrepreneurs around the world and particularly in emerging economies. And we uh, fund and empower their startups. But what we've noticed is that there is certainly a gap in investment interest for early stage startups, especially from emerging economies. And there are some creative investment instruments that are emerging, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can get more funding and attention uh, to this uh, part of the world and to this sector. Thank you. So that's a great question. I just came from Nairobi where there were 
250 people in a room on a Friday and all day on a Saturday. And over three quarters of them were young agripreneurs with, um, the, the, with great ideas, but lacking financial resources. The exciting, um, the exciting difference in this conference was that there were funders in the room who were bringing resources for investment in uh, many of these businesses. The challenge is, it's not enough. I very much support the, the, the new vehicles that are coming online because in, I, I, I mentioned that I'm out at Stanford, and uh, in Silicon Valley and here in Europe, you have family f funds, um, the friends and families who invest at that early stage. If you're in a developing country, you don't have friends and family who can give you even minimal capital to get started. So there are a number of the DFIs that are coming on board to support that early stage capital. The reality of it is, in many cases in the developing world require concessionary money in that very early stage. What we need is that middle, that messy middle as it's called, that capital once the, the, you have a, a proven case of a business that that capital is made available in the developing world for new ideas. There's a new company called Twigga in, um, in, in Nairobi that is an app-based com uh, company that we are all accustomed to using Amazon or other tools to order up food. Twigga is doing that in Nairobi to bring food directly from farmers into Nairobi. And they have gotten past that messy middle because you had an, the, an owner who had a house that he, could, that he could mortgage, much like you would see in any other company, country, that he invested in himself first and then other money came. But we must ensure that between that development capital, that new funding sources are brought online, and then that we have longer term uh, capital that is more patient that will invest in the time period that's necessary for, the, the, for these new companies to build the market that will ultimately provide the returns not just to the entrepreneur, but to the investor. Uthrin, I want to squeeze a lot more out of you, okay. so I'm going to ask you for uh, Shorter. pithy responses to extremely Are pithy you questions. I, am long I would never dare to say <laughs> that, but that answer could have gone on for into the coffee break. <laughs> Let's see. This is this is a great one. I am a young farmer, 26. How can I implement all of the things and all of the innovative processes that you, Ethrin, have been talking about without the capital? You can't. Oh. It won't happen. It won't happen. So what does this young farmer do? I'm standing in front of audiences like this one all around the world to drive new capital into the marketplaces. Here in Europe, because you have young farmers who will say, I didn't come from a family of farmers and I want to go into farming. I can't afford the land. And commercial banks are not providing loans to young entrepreneurs interested in farming. We need to change that. Whether it's in Europe, the US, or in Nairobi. Because it won't happen. We can't expect young people to come into a sector that does not have the capital that is required to support the business. Let's go back into the audience. Okay, hand right there at the back. Fantastic. Organization, who you are, pithy question. Good morning. The microphone will be on. We wouldn't trick you. I don't think so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, hello. Uh, hello, my name is Koen van Keer. I'm, I'm an agronomist from Yara Mineral Fertilizer Company. I have a question uh, concerning to smallholder farmers, and I, want, I will start with a provocative statement. Small is beautiful but too small can be ugly. What, what I mean to say is that 
We all acknowledge that small-scale farmers are very important and, and contribute the bulk of food security today. But going forward, with all these people also wanting to have a better life and access to, to luxury items, do, do you believe that, that the world can continue with having a very large number of really small-scale farmers, like half a hectare to two hectares? Thank you. Small-scale farmers must work in cooperatives in order to support supply chains, in order to support markets. You are absolutely right. We have many small farmers that shouldn't be farmers in the, in, because they're not business people. They can be gardeners, yes, if you want to, but you, we can't depend upon them to support the, supply, the food supply. But we also need to create new businesses, food production businesses. Too often in the developing world in particular, food goes out as raw commodities and comes back in as processed foods because there's no commercialization, there's no production on the continent, in the communities. In those communities, we need to develop the processing plants that provide jobs and economic opportunities for those who are not farmers as business people to ensure that the farmers as business people can work together to grow the food in a, in a more efficient and effective and sustainable way to support a growing mm -hmm. population. All right. Thank you very much, audience. You see the lights have gone down. They will come up again so you'll have more Q&A and conversations with the speakers here on the stage. But for now, please show your appreciation for Earthrun Cousin. Thank you.